Welcome everybody to the Straight Out of BS podcast for another episode. I have a special episode for you guys today. Um, this has been, been a long time in the running, or not a long time in the running, but I've been trying to piece this together for a while now. Um, so I was finally able to get a hold of her, and um, <clears throat> so I'm really looking forward to this interview. Um, hope you guys enjoy it. I wanted to thank you guys so much for all the support. Keep sharing the videos. Uh, like or dislike the video. If you dislike the video, that helps the algorithm too. So just like or dislike the video. Do one or the two. <clears throat> it really helps the algorithm. Comment on the video, even if it's just to say, hey, I went to this school um, and where you went, what years and whatnot. Just, uh, you know, it helps people feel like they're not so alone. And it helps. I mean, I know I know a lot of people have reached out to me and ever since I started my podcast and are like, you know, thanks for this, you know, because of this, you know, it's helped me a lot. I don't feel so alone or I've networked with people that I've never been, I've been looking for or something like that. So just, I'm really happy for all the support and just keep it up. <clears throat> we're making progress. We're making moves. So <clears throat> keep up the good work. And I also wanted to um, <clears throat> do a moment of silence for the addicts still struff- suffering or um, someone still suffering with thoughts, any form of addiction, any form of uh, repressed memories, anything like that. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay, thank you for that. And without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce yourself and um, and just go ahead and kind of introduce yourself. And, you know, I know you've written a book and whatnot. So go ahead and introduce yourself, you know, what what things you've done, like you've written and introduce yourself, I guess. Um, okay, well, thanks for having me on. Um, my name is Liz Ionelli. I uh, recently authored a book called I See You Survivor, Life Inside and Outside the Trouble Teen, or the Totally Fucked Up Trouble Teen Industry. Um, I am a social worker. I am a traumatologist, fancy word for I specialize in treating trauma. I am an artist, a mother, um, I have been uh, a, a fierce advocate in the industry. Uh, starting in 2015, I publicly came out with my story. Uh, I attended the family, uh, also known as the family school, also then again known as the family foundation school, and then later in their final year before they died, Allenwood Academy. Um, so uh, I was there from 1994 until 1997. and. I'm asked a lot about my online handle. Uh, The number 993 or 993 comes from that's how many days I was held captive uh, at a program. I was in uh, the Catskills in upstate New York. uh, And um, so uh, my work life, I've worked uh, in a federal capacity. Uh, I've worked with returning combat veterans. I've had a private practice um, for survivors of institutional abuse. Uh, I myself am a domestic violence survivor, a sexual assault survivor. Um, And I've said it in my interviews uh, when I made the first uh, ICU survivor video. Uh, That was an accident uh, simply because I had been uh, uncomfortably referenced to it was a really rough time in my life and people were referring that I was so uh, badass or I was so this or so that. And I, I really wasn't resonating with that. I was dying inside. Um, so to kind of break the ice for myself, I made a video in which I'll say it again. You know, I do suffer from complex PTSD. I've suffered with depression. I've had crippling anxiety on and off over the years. Uh, OCD has been a part of my life. Uh, I've learned to live with her. Uh, we do okay. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm no different. And I, uh, I'm i a human being just like the rest of us. And I've, I've struggled. And I don't ever want anyone to look at me and think, oh, she's got everything perfect and, and everything's good. And she went to school and had a job and, and all this stuff. I, I've struggled. Uh, and many of you will find out when you read the book, hopefully, that I have hidden uh, a lot of pain from the world because I felt very strongly that in order to help people, I I needed to show this, this badass side of me, which totally exists. 
However, mm. there's a side of me that is incredibly sensitive and that has suffered. Um, and it was very hard for me at times to be speaking out against abuse and not feel like an imposter knowing that I was being abused myself and yeah. I'm able to be open about that now. Um, and, and so that's kind of where I, I come from. I'm a boy mom. Um, and, uh, I, I love what I do. And the book, uh, came to me as an opportunity and you know this is too long-winded probably um but uh none of the the things that publicly have come out uh like in the new york times or this book that i've authored i wrote with brett witter uh it all found me um and i look at everything as an opportunity to share my story hoping that maybe my story which is our collective story uh could be someone else's survival guide so that's really kind of where this is coming from okay <clears throat> i know that as a society we tend to assume that just because somebody's famous or just because they have a lot of money and a perfect example of this is britney spears and her conservatorship um you know we we as a society, a lot of us, you know, infer that, you know, oh, just because they're famous and they have a lot of money, they must not have had to struggle or they must, they must have had a perfect life or, you know, they could, they have all them, they have a ton of money so they can just buy their way, buy their happiness or whatnot. And it's not the case. It's like, you guys are human beings too. And I think as a society, we need to step back and realize that just because they're put on, a lot of these people are put on a pedestal and whatnot, we need to not let that blind us and realize that they're humans too. And there's only, you know, they suffer too, they go through things too. And so, I, you know, it's really good to <clears throat> break that kind of conception. And absolutely, and I, I, I reject the idea of being put on a pedestal and I, I don't, um, particularly now more so than ever, I really didn't understand how public my story uh, was going to become. And with that, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, my fear, my greatest fear of, of this book and, and speaking out publicly, which I really don't do often in a mutual setting, um, is that I'll be separated from where I come from, which is survivor land. And I'm, I'm among you. I'm, I'm no better. Uh, my life might look different to you. Um, for example, I had a massive panic attack this morning for no reason at all it just happens okay and so whether i wrote a book or not or whether you know i was public or on tv or, or whatever you've seen me in or my stupid little TikTok videos that i try and do uh, i'm i'm still one of you and i don't ever want a survivor out there feeling that i'm better or different i mean i am different but in a way that would separate me from where i come from and and that's uh, you know i will never sell out that's that's one thing I take pride in that I'm um, able to be vulnerable and open about my life and I share my struggles so that I don't get separated from the pack or considered some uh, different elitist kind of, uh, you know, survivorship is survivorship and I'm, I'm down with the sickness with all of us. I'm in the trenches with you. Um, so that's like my worst fear and, and part of me coming out in these kind of situations um, survivors might be uh, surprised to learn that being public, although I might make it look uh, easy or um, I, I, don't, I don't know what they would think, but it's, it's terrifying for me. Uh, even coming onto a, a live video podcast like this, this is uh, something for me. I'm, I'm very self-conscious. I've, I've struggled with uh, eating disorders during my life. Uh, I suffer from body dysmorphia. I have a lot of fear about publicly appearing. So you, a photograph is a snapshot of my life, you know, and, and a, the book will kind of take you through a written uh, river of the, the highs and lows that I've had. Um, but I'm, I'm trying even through this engagement to try and push forward so that survivors can get to know me more and and I just I want to be accessible and, and I cannot stress enough. I go through similar things many of you have. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I just I really hope I can remain uh, in survivor land. And, and this book is just a vehicle to give us a louder voice as a collective. 
Awesome. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I want to get more into like how the book came about and whatnot. Um, but before I, and before I do that, I want to get a little bit more about like your past, like before you went to the program and like how your experiences in the program and whatnot. Um, but also before that, where can people purchase this book if they want to purchase it or where can they, they where can they access it? Um, right now, uh, it's on Amazon uh, online. Uh, there's, there was some confusion. The book won't like in uh, tangibly be sent out as a book until August. Um, okay. The reason it's August, everyone's like, why is it so long or what takes so long is like, I don't know. This is just the way it works. Um, but also, too, I did have a slight hand in it. Um, my experience at this program started in the transition from summer to fall. And uh, I wanted it to kind of seasonally coincide where the book begins so that the reader in real time can look around and maybe conceptualize or feel when this this took place. Um, so uh, leading up to being sent away to the family, um, I had uh, I was uh, I was sexually abused as a child. Yeah. Um, and I uh, developed, uh, as to be expected, but not understood at the time, massive anxiety and anger issues. I switched schools. Uh, I was being bullied quite a bit. And um, that was a horrible experience uh, being bullied. Uh, my weight was a focus, my hair, my braces, you know, um, I was just kind of an odd kid um but i was just different but that didn't mean i back then in the, the early 90s that was i had black nail polish and my parents thought i was worshiping the devil and you know um all these things were indicators or signs that my parents were being told that i was in like this danger zone okay and music and all the regular teenage stuff was i an angel fuck no i i was angry. I was violent. Um, I was like a, a street angel house devil. You know, um, I had a very difficult time making friends. I was just a volatile kid and I didn't have the words for what I was feeling. And and that led to a lot of misunderstanding about what I was going through at that time. I stopped going to school. I just I was just, you know, like Taylor Swift says, like, hi, I'm the problem. It's me like that was me. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD, which at the time was like being diagnosed with cancer and it required immediate treatment. And my parents who are professionals were told by the world um, and other professionals that, you know, I needed to uh, be sent to a program or I was going to end up dead in jail, pregnant, uh, you know, uh, ruining my life. And um, so my guidance counselor and, and my therapist at the time and a bunch of other professionals recommended uh, that I be put into uh, placement. And this was, uh, I still don't know the true story of how my parents found this particular place. They had hired an educational consultant um, and there was a large pocket geographically from where I lived of kids that were sent to the family. So I think that had a lot to do with it. And uh, so I, I arrived uh, there in the fall of uh, 1994. Okay. And when you got there, uh, <clears throat> if you already answered this, I apologize, but where was this located again? It was, uh, it's a town called Hancock, New York. Put okay. that on the map. It's in the Catskills and uh, we were on a property. Uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, probably about 80 acres uh, surrounded the property and, and uh, we were kind of like in a valley. So wherever we were, everything was uh, uphill and rugged, um, not a friendly environment in the summer or the winter. And uh, it was a pretty isolated place for sure. Okay. Um, what was the structure of the program like? The, like the overarching structure, like, <clears throat> like was it a WASP program with the seminars or was it more of a religious base or um, focus? I, I really can't identify the exact thread that we came from, but we were very heavily um, uh, similar to a straight spinoff. We we're okay. very similar to Elan. Um, many of the, or the one thing that really I think separates us from Elan is we didn't really have the ring proper where you would fight other kids, but we had other avenues. Um, all the modalities were the same. So we were kind of a mix. We weren't a wasp 
program per se. Um, but we did take in a lot of kids from wilderness programs that would end up with us. And um, at the time when I arrived, there was only about 50 of us there. Um, I was asked that. So it was, you know, it was small um, and uh, they they touted that they could treat, they were based off of the uh, the AAA, which is the All Addicts Anonymous, which was a spinoff from the Oxford group, which was from Synanon, which originated with the seed. So we have a long lineage, but then there was this Christian radicalized uh, fundamental part and they weaponized the principles of AA and they pretty much took that and trashed it uh, and rewrote it in the way that would suit them best. So yeah. the modality, I believe strongly, um, really turned a lot of people away from what could have been uh, a useful resource from them if they needed to go into the rooms. Many of us shied away from it because they radicalized it and really added this really fucked up religious component that had no basis or bearing to be on this planet. For sure. Uh, when you got there, did they buddy you up with anybody? Did they go over rules with you? Did they give you a rule manual? Anything like that? I like, don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember getting a handbook. Um, and again, I was there in the infancy of this particular property. This was like the second. They had an original site and they rebuilt up the road. Um, so th they were still in like the experimental phase. But when I arrived, it was the typical uh strip searching taking any personal effects uh there was really no uh welcome you know here's your new you know um they called your body system or belt looping the equivalent for us would have been shadow or a double shadow and that was you know, a senior member that was assigned to you they couldn't be there less than six months like they had a lot of rules about how long they'd been there um but yes i was given a shadow and all of my communication was shut off from the outside world to include my parents um, and they took all of my personal effects and you really learn the rules as they came up. So it was kind of a, a very, uh, the 90s um, was a very uh, experimental and savage phase that they were going to in, in order to fine tune and elaborate their control that lend itself, it just bled over into the 2000s. Um, so um, there may have been some changes along the way, but the place was inherently evil from the day it was conceived until the day that it was shut down. For sure. I totally agree. Uh, did you have seminars there? Did they do the seminar thing, the whole premiere seminar? Or did they have you go through seminars there at all? Um, what they would have were table <laughs> topics, and that's where an individual would be singled out, kind of like a confrontation circle, but in a different format. Um, where a student would be stood in front of a U-shaped table formation with staff at the head or what represented mother, father, family leaders. Uh, they didn't have to be related, but um, sometimes they were. And uh, what, when I was there, there was only, uh, it went by family. So as I was leaving, they were broaching into making up. There was, I was never like family one. I think it went up to family eight, I believe, at the end. Um, but there was no, they were just starting to start a family too on my exit. So they expanded by families going forward. Um, so that, that was our equivalent of seminar, I guess you could say. And then there was also what was called the house topic, which was the more brutal option where instead of it just being a smaller group of your collect, you know, family, they would open it to every kid that was there um, and they would all congeal. And that was usually um, designed to be more humiliating and open you up just to more confrontation from other students. And then when they were done, uh, just victim shaming you or just humiliating you, whatever they chose to do, then um, students would be encouraged to suggest sanctions, which were our, our word for punishment or um, or what we needed to get closer to God or what the, the remedy would be for our uh, sins. It could have been sitting in a corner, being wrapped in a blanket. Uh, there was trotting sanction. I mean, like the sanction list was endless and it was a rolling kind of admission, like whatever the most savage uh, thing that could be, nothing had to do with helping you. It was really about hurting you, but we thought we were helping, right? So it was put under this pretense of like, we need to help so-and-so, what can we do, you know? And so 
uh, it was like a Lord of the Fly situation. Um, and that's pretty much how they did it. And uh, we were always assigned uh, what they would identify as our sponsor, which was just a random staff member, but they were really our handler and they were our lifeline to all of the, the our, our hierarchy of needs. They controlled everything from food to sleep to your comfort, whether you had a blanket or not, whether you know you could speak, make eye contact, like they just, they were completely in charge of your life and your life depended on them heavily. <clears throat> Definitely. Um, did you, was there points and level system there or did you kind of just, how did that work? Um, we didn't have like a traditional point system or a level system. Um, after I left, they had uh, some different ranking. I think anchors was one and they would be given a pin, um, but I can really only speak to, to my time there. There was really, you were a new person until they decided that you were just like a regular worm that lived there. <laughs> and then uh, you could rise uh, if you were lucky enough to becoming a senior member um but that was really all uh we had and then there was staff so the senior members were also like enforcers like they kind of had a very powerful role um and then there was just the rest of us and then the you know the new people coming in that was really at the time that was the structure okay um how long after you got there or well first off did you get transported or did your parents bring you up there my parents brought me there. Okay. And uh, how long after you got there did it take for th things to fully sink in and for you to realize, oh shit, this place is crazy. This place isn't isn't normal. Um, I would say about ten minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, within ten minutes of my arrival, I knew something was terribly wrong, and I could it, it just I can't explain it other than it was just a. Uh, a darkness and this feeling of just uh, safety was a thing of the past that this was going to be something savage and this it just nothing felt okay nothing okay um and did they did they let you guys write letters at all or did they give you guys phone calls and if they did give you phone calls how long after you got there till your first phone call um we eventually it was a privilege to communicate so any letters that we were allowed to write were reviewed first by your sponsor. Uh, and it had to be, uh, at the time when I was there, they would make you either rewrite it or they would dictate it to you or whatever it was. Uh, I never turned in a letter to go home that didn't have some amendments made or redacted, rewritten, you know. Um, and in order for it to be mailed out, your sponsor would like mine was Robin Ducey and she would just lick the envelope like I can't even tell you and then she would have to initial um her initials and her writing uh on the envelope all that was a procedure so your parents would know that it was authorized mail being sent out that it wasn't like a rogue letter which they should have reported to the program if they got a letter that did not have the initials um phone calls I don't remember exactly when I got my first phone call home um but they uh were about five minutes i believe was the limit and when i was there there uh when you made the call a senior member would be uh or your shadow whoever it was staff would be standing there and when you're so you were completely supervised and when the five minutes was up it was like they either hit it to hang up on you or you had to say a quick goodbye and hang up um, so even prisoners had more time on the phone than we did in 1994. Yeah, it's really messed up. Uh, did they have intervention uh, slash solitary confinement and or study hall or worksheets? Um, anything like that at the, at the place you were at? Um, they, they didn't really have worksheets or we didn't have any of these like books or like, like we had other assignments that we would have to do um, or take our, our uh, fearless and searching, whatever search of our moral yeah. story, whatever that meant. Um, yeah. Basically just a forced confession. Um, but uh, they did have isolation. Uh, they did have the corner uh, where you weren't allowed to interact with anyone. Uh, the the boiler room, when I was there, it was just one building. They later built out and they had 
like actual isolation cubes or whatever closet. Oh. Okay. Um, but when I was there, the boiler room uh, was where literally the boiler and the furnace and all the equipment, it was just like a basement set up and that's where they would dump you. Um, and generally to be in there, you had to be in the blanket. Um, they hadn't, they hadn't really done much. That was their go-to way to confine or punish you, um, was to the blanket. Okay. And, uh, what was their policy on runners? Did you see any runners? Uh, did they say that they would be violent towards runners if they were caught? I know that at the place I was at, I would hear constantly all the time, what happens in the woods stays in the woods, so don't run. So. No, um, I mean, we did have, uh, you know, I saw a bunch and I ran away uh, many times myself. The kids who did bolt, um, we it would be announced um, or a staff member would ring this bell um, and or they would pick off. You know, I remember one time we were at a table topic and uh, I, I, I don't know who it was, but this kid just like literally in the middle of getting just lambasted by staff just fucking took off <laughs> running out the door. You know, I was like, oh, you know, and silently would be like, go, go, go. But um, but there was also this like excitement to remember, we didn't have TV, we had no communication, like we were just like angry and bored. OK, so if you took off running, the staff member could just be like, you, 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 you go, you know, and they would go run to the vans and they would patrol the property. So, uh, you know, it was a really capture the flag situation and you became like a prized uh, uh, eight point buck during hunting season. And it was really um, notable to catch a runner. Uh, you would almost get a little bit of praise for finding them and, and dragging them back or shoving us into a van and, and bringing us back. So, um, and the property where we were, it was rugged terrain and there were hills everywhere. So the ones who, there were some kids that made it all the way to New York City. There were some kids <laughs> that made it home. I don't know how, um, but there were also, uh, kids that uh, didn't return and I can't really I have no idea if they were found made at home they were killed kidnapped uh, there was not a lot of accountability back then um, so yeah we, we did have runaways pretty often I would say um, it was rare that somebody could bust out of their we lived in trailers uh, or under in the basement of the owner's home so they would do landlocking and drag the bunk across the door um, you know, later on, I'm sure they advanced their techniques, but there really wasn't a way to bust out during the night without being caught. So it was really, dusk was a very favorable time to bolt. And also right before breakfast was an opening for you from the dorm to the main building to just disappear. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. How was the food there? Was it horrible? Was there anything that you actually like semi enjoyed? Like I wouldn't even call that shit food, okay? I would have rather eaten dog food for 993 days than the shit they served. The All one, right. I remember they served this this beef stroganoff, which was fucking oh. disgusting. Um, and uh, uh, as punishment, uh, you would get uh, mapo, which is like a cut rate, just, I don't know, just a disgusting porridge kind of situation. Uh, and English muffins and tuna, okay? Like, this is how I know if you didn't go to my program. If you love tuna, I don't trust you because, <laughs> okay, like, tuna, and this wasn't just, like, mm, some fresh tuna. This is, like, gray industrial <laughs> government tuna in oil, okay? Like, it, no, nothing good. The only thing I remember looking forward to, as, as sad as this was, I think it was, like, I, I don't know. I was on half portion all the time. Like, they regulated how much food you could have, but... I remember on Saturdays, sometimes I could get two, they looked like fish sticks, but they were French toast sticks. And that was like the highlight of my Saturday morning, if we got it, you know? So, but the food wasn't even food. It was total fucking shit. <laughs> That's all I can say about the food. And, and I definitely, um, uh, the food issues there were common ground. And a lot of our table topics were during the times that we would be eating, right, at meals. So for me, violence, coincided with eating so like it was just trauma for everyone trauma was served for every meal okay not food that's that's all i can say about the food but yeah, yeah it wasn't even food even the water tasted bad do, do you do you suffer to this day from uh can did you have a difficulty eating food like in a in a setting like that 
I do. I do. I, I rarely eat out. Um, I do not like to eat in front of others. Uh, I can, um, but it's uncomfortable for me. I don't like people watching me eat. Um, and uh, I have suffered from, uh, it's, it's an off stem of trauma, but I have a lot of restrictive eating um, that usually, uh, I have a, a really good control of it now and I have a kick-ass therapist. Um, but yeah, I've definitely suffered uh, food uh, control issues around food. For sure. Okay. Um, what What do you think the if you had to choose one thing <clears throat> about being in that program that was the hardest for you? What do you think it would be, and how did you deal with it in the program? I would say the hardest thing for me was dealing with um, n- not just the violence uh, and my my rape and and other things that happened. I think the hardest part was the intense loneliness that I felt there. I I felt um, that if I died, nobody would know, nor would they care. Uh, having friends was uh, not even a reality. Uh, you formed alliances. You really couldn't have made friends. I mean, you had your little circles maybe but it wasn't like a high school where you had like this click and that click it was boys over here girls over here and we all just trickled down through our own um kind of hierarchy uh and you you couldn't be friends with anybody because you couldn't trust anyone because in three seconds they could turn on you or to save themselves they throw you in front of the bus or sometimes i fucking stood myself up just like i hadn't been stood up in a while at the table uh, for a table topic so i would stand myself up like everybody else would to make yourself look guilty or look like you were working some kind of bogus program um uh so yeah for me it was the intense loneliness and the um constant shaming um that got to me uh, quite a bit and i didn't cope with it I mean, you just learn to live with it um, or exist with it. It just became my reality. So I just, you know, and that's that's what I would say, you know, I mean, yes, did I suffer from tremendous assault and punishments and those things? Yes. But the loneliness uh, has followed me throughout my life. Um, And it's been very difficult for me to make friends um and i'm you know i'm a little socially awkward too sometimes and and i know that um but that i think and and the shaming and the self-hatred that i carried from that program has been extremely destructive in my life so that's what i can say to that okay um did they have any sort of grad like graduation ceremony there at the program you were at they did. Um, I bolted before I got to attend mine. Uh, when I realized I had turned 18, uh, it was really just a propaganda parade uh, where they would select certain students to read shit that they gave you, or you know, you could read this thing of how the the place saved your life and you loved it here. <laughs> and like you know, like we all knew it was just like bullshit, but it was just necessary. Um, so parents were invited. We did have like parent. Um, productions like where we would uh have to do like these school plays and chorus uh to show off to our parents like how reformed we were how wonderful we looked and and how much we smiled but other than that um uh i i never attended the graduation ceremony so um but i i do know they had them okay and so so you got pulled from the program you turned 18 right yeah i found out i was 18 by accident we didn't really have a good handle on time (laughs) you know so like yeah i know right so i was like shit i think i'm 18 i'm out of here and that's exactly what happened okay and what happened after you turned 18 what was your exit plan what did they do for you did they do anything (laughs) i didn't have a plan my plan was to try and get some food um go back home whatever that meant um you know, I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere in the world. And I had a very difficult, difficult time um, reintegrating back into life, society. I didn't know who I was, what I was, who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, where I belonged, who I could talk to. I didn't trust anybody. I was, I would say I was feral um, probably for the first five or six years after leaving. Okay. Well, walk us through like after you got out of the program and like what happened after you got out of the program and then like 
lead from that into like what what sparked you to write the book and like what like how that came about sure i mean my my life after the program took many 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 uh twists and turns um i got married young i had children young um i was on a mission to look normal and and have a life i, I was just I, I just remember perpetually just suffering inside and feeling like I just couldn't understand, like, I just couldn't wrap my brain around what just happened. And then, so I was um, about two weeks after I got out, uh, this, the new school year uh, for college was starting. And unbeknownst to me, uh, college applications were sent out on my behalf. Uh, and I was accepted uh, at a university in Western New York. And so two weeks after I learned how to, I had to learn how to drive. I had to take my road tests and I had to, uh, I got my license and then I was given a, a map, a paper map back then for those of you who may not remember. <laughs> and um, yeah, no GPS, uh, I was a new driver and um, I packed up whatever was given to me to go to college. I didn't know what was going on. And I had about a 10 hour drive uh, as a new driver. Um, and I drove out to this college uh, and uh, I was terrified. I finally had the courage to walk up to the registration table or whatever. I signed my name, they gave me a key, they pointed to a building. I went and got what little things I had in my car and uh, I had a single room and uh, I didn't come out uh, for a very long time. The only time I would come out of that room for the year until they found out that I was living at college, not going to college, was um, I was just too scared to leave my room. I was terrified that the family was coming back to get me. I had a lot of paranoia. Um, I was still convinced uh, they were really into mind control, like covert mind control. And I thought they could read my thoughts, my mind. Um, I, uh, I spent most of my time listening to an AM FM radio that was left behind. And that's how I learned about uh, life. Um, and then one night I discovered off topic, but really fun. Um, I wandered into the uh, lobby at midnight, like the student lounge or whatever, and a TV was on and I discovered South Park. And okay. that South Park was like the news for me. That's like, <laughs> <where> <laughs> most of my information about the world and i remember being like what is this shit like oh my god where have i been um and i would i would come out of my room at night and i would run across a field to a gas station and and again like i didn't even use the door i would jump out my window i was on the first floor that i you know who knows what i would have done but um so so i started off on a really bad entrance to the world i just couldn't figure this thing out you know and finally the school caught on that i was living there and my car had stayed parked where it was when i arrived so eventually they were like yeah you gotta go hmm. um and then you know i i tumbled through a lot of jobs um i worked in emergency medical services for a period of time while i went into my second college um and uh then i took more time off uh you know and i worked for a while and then i went back for a master's but like in between that whole area it was just don't let it fool you with this illusion of like oh i went to school and i had a job like i was an adrenaline junkie i was angry i was violent i was very uh dysregulated with my emotions i was having a very hard time uh with food and um you know i i really really struggled you know and i don't just I don't make mistakes twice. Like I make them at least three or four times just to be sure. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, but yeah, so I had this really rocky road, rocky relationships. Um, I struggled with motherhood um, during that phase. I, I just, I just struggled. Um, and then, uh, and then I went dormant. I uh, eventually landed, um, I was recruited out of grad school and I had a federal job and um it was uh during that time i was just terrified that somebody would find out um that i had gone to the family and it was like really stuck in my brain like if they found out i would be less smart or less capable of my job or less credentialed or less educated or just a 
I would live up to this shitty human being that I thought I was. So I kept it this massive secret um, of mine. And um, you didn't then, want them to put you in a box, right? Hmm. They didn't. You didn't want them to put you in a box. Right? Yeah. And I didn't want anyone to know. I, it was like this dirty secret that I had. And even though it was done to me, I felt that I owned this and I was just emulating all of this trauma. And I felt like such a piece of shit and that I didn't even deserve to be there. Even though I had the education and the skill level and, and all of these things, I just, even at a federal level, I still felt like an imposter. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, all this dumpster fire shit happened, but then uh the morning of uh it was uh well uh john martin crawford um my very very close friend um october 24th 2015 uh he unalived and um when i found out the next morning uh my world uh exploded and it was the uh the beginning of something that i didn't understand yet but it was um, prohibited for me to, in a, as a federal employee, I was prohibited from ever speaking out or uh, for regulation for governmental changes. Like I had a lot of bylaws and a lot of rules that I had. Uh, we just had a lot of rules, okay? And so I couldn't advocate prior or do anything about anything and let alone have the courage to say anything about who I was or where I came from. And that wasn't really the venue I really wanted to put this on blast. So it was actually during when I was reading John's eulogy um, that I decided that I was going to pack up shop and I was going to uh, the following Monday uh, put in my paperwork requesting the process out. And that process took about a year to exit. And uh, when I fully retired um, from that job, that's when I, I publicly decided that I was going to tell my story. And uh, a lot of it was driven when I was at John's funeral, looking out in the faces of those who had attended. There were a lot of us that came from all over. Some I knew, some I didn't. Um, but just seeing the power of us assembled there, I, once again, it was the first time in my life I'd ever seen us together since being back at this shitty place. And um, the power in them just being there radically changed my life. So if you were at that funeral, that day you were part of making or helping me make a radical life decision that I was going to leave this federal job and everyone said I was fucking crazy and I was but I did and and that's when I started speaking out publicly and that kind of evolved um, into this kind of uh, social media war zone that I entered um, and starting to post and kind of dip my toes in the water and get comfortable with uh, being me, uh, and it was uh, the internet was an amazing way for me to reach a lot of people at once, and it was a great exercise in me learning to kind of lean into my own trauma and acknowledge who I was and where I came from. Uh, and many people know I was um, I had started counting the number of those who had died and kind of logging in. Uh, and I was like the crypt keeper they called me in the in the times, and I was kind of keeping the scrolls of all the losses that we had had because my friend John, you know, unalived and then Marissa and then Mike and, and Jay before all that. Like, so all of my little close net of friends had died. And I was like, oh my God, am I next? Like what the fuck is going on? So being research based, that's where I started to track this and survivors, you know, across the country were helping me and giving me information. And from that, um, there was uh, Matt Azimi, uh, who was uh, a special ed teacher in New York City, who was found, uh, he overdosed uh, in the bathroom uh, at the school after he had put all the kids on the bus. And a crime reporter named Mike Wilson covered that story. And when he called Mike Azimi's uh, friends, uh, the, you know, his wife said, I don't know much about that place call, the people that knew him most. Uh, he reached out, Mike Wilson spoke with three of Matt's friends, and they all knew Matt from this place called The Family. And none of those friends had anything good to say about that place. So it sparked Mike's interest. Um, and then he reached out to me, and we met, and I, I told him my story and what I was doing and why I thought it was important. And he decided that he was going to pursue this. And 
The article in totality probably took about 18 months to put together. It's not instant. Everything looks like it's instant on uh, in media, print, whatever it is, but it's not. It's a process. And um, in 2018, I woke up and I, with no advance warning, I went down to the gas station to get cigarettes and I just happened to glance over and I did a double take. They had already photographed me in April prior and it came out in January. I looked down and I fucking saw myself, right? And I was like, um, excuse me. And so like, I just bought one copy quick and ran out. And then I, I, that's the first time I saw it too. I saw it with everybody else. Um, And so uh, then Mike Wilson ended up writing a second article. I can't say much. Uh, I I have a heavy NDA in place, but I did under the Child Victims Act have an opportunity to um, uh, file a a, a case um, in terms of negligence regarding uh, the negligent acts that led up to my uh, repeated sexual assaults. And um, based on that, and others too were extremely brave and also came forward. And so from that, Mike decided to write uh, with the backing of the Times, a second article about it as much as we could say. And um, about a week after it was pu- published, uh, I got a, an email, a letter from a writer in Georgia named Brett Witter, and he basically wrote a love letter to my trauma and asked if he could uh, be the one to help me tell this story, which he felt was important. And I thought about it for a little bit. You know, I, I, as one would think I did not rush into this opportunity. I wasn't like, yeah, let's put my whole life story on blast. Like, let's tell everybody everything. Um, but I, I spoke with him and, uh, I just could feel that he had compassion and, and love and understanding for, for survivors. And he's often written about people who have gone through incredible situations. And I felt a duty to survivor land to take the opportunity for us to possibly have a louder platform and a voice to, to do this. I didn't know what I was walking into. I didn't know what to expect. I've never written a book, let alone about my life. Um, But that's how uh, it started. And Brett came and spent a considerable amount of time with me every day. And just, we did a lot of interesting stuff, fun stuff. Uh, That guy had, he probably got like so much secondhand smoke from me. I'm sorry, Brett, if you ever see this, I'm so sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, he hung in there with me and he even, uh, I took him back to where the program was like, we did a lot of field trips and a lot of things. And he learned a lot about me so much so that he really did capture my voice in this book. Um, and then, uh, a lot of people have asked questions about book stuff and, and what happens is when you have a writer, they usually have an agent and then you make proposals to multiple, uh, publishing houses and there were three in the end that had really fought to get that spot so i interviewed each of them actually which i had no idea that was you know that was a privilege for me um and i i ended up selecting hachette um and i have a female editor and she's badass and i have a really cool team over there oh my god hold on something terrible is happening sorry can you still see me oh my god i'm such a talk Okay. Um, and so basically, um, the book, you know, was written and, and, you know, so these three publishing houses wanted the story and I selected Hachette Publishing House. Um, and I have a really kick-ass team on that. And the book, um, is written and from now, uh, uh, until August, 2023, when it goes out officially, uh, you know, I'm just going to be, uh, it's by invitation, you know, I can, uh, talk to people kind of engage, um, you know, but I'm really trying to take this time to intimately let survivors get to know me more for those who don't know me. Um, and I, I want this to be a very positive experience. And although the book, it is about my time in a program and it is about survivor land and it is about, you know, the trials and triumphs that I've had it's really a testament to uh, survivorship and it's for anyone that's been through abuse and it's really about triumph over trauma. 
and um, also bringing awareness to the situation. And, you know, there's a historical component, you know, the lineage of really where we come from, you know, everything from straight incorporated through all the different programs, WASP, the indigenous pop, you know, kids in Canada, all over the world. Really, this is a systemic issue um, of institutionalized abuse and and the ramifications that it has for society overall like we all pay for this it's not just us um and we're cycle breakers you know th those of us who are here to tell our story it's about being agitators and cycle breakers and and you know we're screaming at the top of our lungs so the brothers and sisters behind us don't have to and and that's what this book is is about and it's for and you don't have to have gone to a troubled teen industry program for this to be relevant to you there's something for everyone to take away from the book um so it's been a very interesting process it's been a very painful process emotionally taxing process uh it's it's uh it's intense but i'm really hoping that it's going to help save lives and and there are also souls out there that need to heal um i used to focus a great deal on those that we've lost and i i definitely still hold space for them but i've grown into this idea that the only way i can honor them the best or i feel like we all could is by living and living well and there are still you know my focus has shifted now towards those definitely who are still alive and here and now in the lives that we have yet to live. Um, or we could be out there kicking ass, like whatever, wherever you are in your in your process of becoming who you are or having become, you know, your best self, this is a book about growth and, and it's about um, having courage and, and even, you know, even the darkest spaces uh, deserve some light to be shed. And, and that's what this book is about. You know, it's not, again, it's not just my story. This is our story. Okay, cool. Awesome. <clears throat> <clears throat> At the program you went to, did you see any of the staff members like being inappropriate with any of this? Hear about any of the staff members giving students uh, drugs and also going off of that, did did they load people up with prescription medications or take people off medications when they got to that program? Do you, did you hear anything about that? They were very anti-medication. Um, the one quote medication they loved to give out was Fisherman's Friend. If any of you are familiar with that, it is a very disgusting uh, cough, I won't even say drop, uh, it's just disgusting. Uh, it, it tastes like dirt with mint. Um, but th that was like their Windex for everything, like Fisherman's Friend, have a headache, Fisherman Friend, you know, like that they they were not about medication or anything that would alter your um, mental state. You know, like I haven't met anyone yet in my clinical travels that got high on Tylenol, but uh, we didn't even have that. So um, that that was really their policy. OK, and did you see any staff being inappropriate with the students or anything like that when you're there or hear about it? Um, every day they were, the whole thing was fucking inappropriate. Okay. Yeah. They were yeah. Physically inappropriate, verbally inappropriate, sexually inappropriate, uh, the way they conducted themselves. Um, you know, anybody that, any adult that was able to stomach that or see that and not say something or participate or even be a bystander or a witness, guilty. Okay. <clears throat> I, you know, I understand there are some staff members that have come forward and, and now realize and are willing to speak their truth, but that's like 0.0000% of, of the uh, the people that, that took money from this program and housing to work there. It was a breeding ground for pedophiles. It was a gr breeding ground for angry nobodies to become angry somebodies. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I, every every moment of that of my day was inappropriate. Every every engagement they had with us, I can't like single out one instance or this or that. Like the whole thing, like every program, just completely across the board, totally total incompetence, power tripping, unqualified, not even professionals. Okay, maybe high school grads, maybe um, who 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 made their life or their life work preaching propaganda, radicalizing religion, tormenting and torturing and abusing children, children. We were fucking children. 
And and that, that's all I can say to that, um, everything about all of it. And and society looked the other way and, and that's inappropriate. So systemically, this this it just bleeds out um, everywhere. So I can't say anything there was well-intended or good, no matter what the circumstance. I know my position is radical, but but I stand behind it. Um, I, I, that was just fuckery. That wasn't therapy. That, that was money-driven, uh, power-hungry people who took an opportunity to capitalize on our pain, and that's exactly what they did. Very agreed, fully. Um, <clears throat> what was the process like for writing the book? Like, did you... Because I've considered, I've been, eventually I want to write a book. And I know that I keep on saying eventually I'm going to do it. I should just do it. But um, my thing is, like, I just don't know exactly where I should start. Um, and so, like, did you use journal, like, did you journal when you were in the program and use the journal entries to fill in, like, the blanks? Or did you just have a good memory? Like, how? Well, we, we didn't have, we didn't have the opportunity to, like, keep Dear Diary. Like, that was just unheard of. Um um, no, I, 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 a lot of it, you know, and again, I was very fortunate that I was gifted Brett, my writer. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the, you know, it, it was really a, a conversation that we had over time, um, that we were, you know, in, in a very confined space together. Um, it was, it was intense. I mean, it wasn't like I had to give a play by play. It was really uh just multiple conversations like a very long conversation about my life about you know he basically took my confession for life and uh he helped put it onto paper in a way that that it's my voice and that um that really depicts what my experience was and and he did it so well so i had a different experience you know i don't know i had always wanted to write a book too but i just there was no way I was going to sit down and type that out. This never would have happened if I hadn't had help. And and so for me, I was fortunate in that context. Um, it was a wild process uh, for sure. And there's that nervousness that you have, like, oh my God, I'm going to put this shit out to the world. Like, oh boy, you know, I hope this helps, you know. Um, but if I'm going to tell my story, I'm going to tell my story. And and so I really had to lean into that. And I got more comfortable with Brett over the time that we spent. And um, thankfully, he was really cool about the whole process. And he really held space for my trauma as well. He wasn't just like sitting like, OK, and then what happened? And then what happened? It really wasn't uh, a very linear process. It was kind of a big ebb and flow kind of thing that ended up being the totality of what the book contains. Okay, and how long did it take you to write the book? How long? Well, I, how long? Well, boy, I mean, I think we've gone through. Um, well, I, it's almost been a full year since I sat with Brett. Okay. Um, so you know, it's, it's about that long. Not so, bad. Yeah. Shout out to Brett, by the way. Oh yeah, he's so cool. Like, yes. Shout out. Yeah, he's he's an incredible human being, um, and I, I couldn't think of anybody else that I would have wanted, let alone would have allowed to tell my story. I have no regret. Awesome. Um, regarding your parents, uh, how is your relationship with your parents? Have you tried talk to them, talking to them about how this program affected you? Do they know about your book? Um, well, let's start there. Let's start there. That's a really interesting question. Um, my relationship with my parents has traditionally been very um, tumultuous and strained. Um, I don't blame my parents. I, I used to harbor a lot of resentment. Um, it's and it's not about like forgiveness. Like they they were the first victims of this system. So, and and I really, I point the finger at society because at that time, society taught my parents, like every other parent, that my differences were wrong or that if I was different or I had different, I just was different. And, and they were taught to, to think that that's what was broken about me, that I didn't conform. And so they were 
just as much victimized by the the industry, you know, in in a sense where they were so tricked and duped into believing that what they were doing was to help me. I don't believe they would have done or placed me there or left me there as long as I was if they had known what the truth was. But as we all know, it wasn't like we could just call home and be like, hey, mom, you know, like her dad. So, but, but unfortunately, you know, the family crushed my family. And I can, I don't think we've ever really fully recovered from that experience. Um, I don't know if they know about the book or not. Um, I'm not um, pushing it on them. I, I don't, uh, you know, I kind of respect that they have their own lives and, um, you know, I don't harbor resentment against them. I, I, as a parent myself, I would never want to consider that actions I took harmed my children or my child. And um, I, you know, I, I love my parents. Um, do I have the dream mother daughter or father daughter relationship that I had thought I would have as a child growing up? No, but many people, um, I think don't end up with the family that, you know, that, that movie shit or that Hallmark bullshit. Every family has secrets. Every family harbors trauma. Um, I mean, I, I, I love this idea. There are families out there that are perfectly functioning and everyone's okay. And that's great. Like, you're lucky, you know, but that wasn't always my experience. So, you know, I, I can't stress enough, you know, the family crushed my family and it'll never go back quite the way it was. And it was difficult already. So it's hard for me to even conceptualize like what we could have been as a family because we didn't really start out on a great foot. Does that make sense? Um, but, you know, in terms of the book, I mean, if they read it, that's their choice. If they don't, that's okay. Like my, uh, my now 20 years ago, I would have been like, oh my God, you gotta, you know, if you don't read this, like, you know, but I don't feel that way anymore because this book is, is I know what my truth is and I know what the story and where I'm trying to go with it. And I don't really subscribe or need my parents approval, even though I would kill for any ounce of, um, approval or or something more than whatever I am able to get. Um, but I, you know, there'll always be a gaping hole there, but I do have other um, moms who have stepped in to kind of be my uh, de facto mother. And I have other, you know, like father figures in my life. So I've, I've made my own family essentially. And I have my children, um, their father and I are very good friends. Uh, so, you know, I, I, lean heavily on those who love me openly. Um, so for me, I, I accept, you know, it's kind of like um, Nadia Boltz Weber explained it best. It, in terms of forgiveness, like I like to do it the badass way. And, and the way I describe it, it's like this, I'll never say what happened to me was okay or that our relationship was awesome and amazing and that what happened to me, like, don't worry about it. It's not like that. It's me saying like that I refuse to remain chained to you in this trauma bond, you know, so I'm just going to reach over and grab some bolt cutters and just sever that between us so that we don't drown together. And, and that was my choice. Um, and it's not so much like a non-communicative way, but it was really an emotional way for me to visualize what I needed to do in order to become a whole and healthy woman and person and friend and mother and you know so that's kind of how i chose to to deal with that but i i do love them um and i i am still their daughter um and i always will be you know that's not going to change and i have a lot of life left in front of me where a majority of their lives are behind them so it's to no benefit to me to punish them or shove a book down their throat. Like they don't need any proof that I'm a wild child. You know what I mean? Like they already know that I'm just, I'm going to be who I am unapologetically anyway. So um, a book to them isn't going to make any difference, you know? For sure. Yeah. I've always, <clears throat> with my parents, I've forgiven them, but I'm never going to forget what, what they did. And that's but, okay. Like everyone's process with their parents. Like if you hear nothing from me today, hear that it's totally okay. However you feel, it's okay. It's valid. All right. Yeah. Anger isn't going to help anybody, but if you're angry, 
be angry, you know, um, but try and find a different way if you can. Yeah, don't repress anything. I always say repressing things is not healthy. You know, and our parents are who they are. Likely of them changing at this point in our lives, slim to none. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and that's okay though. Like we still have each other. We still have lives to live. I'm not gonna spend my life wishing and hoping and you know, wanting this like leave it to beaver shit. You know, I wouldn't want that anyway. I would, you know what I mean? I would have been Wednesday at the dinner table then. So, you know what I mean? So just, just be you and celebrate the life that you have to live. Uh, your life doesn't, it doesn't matter all the time of what your parents think. It's what do you think? What do you feel? What are the people who love and care about you most? How do, how do you feel about yourself? That, that really is the most important thing. And we were kind of, at least my generation, I'm in my early forties you know, our parents and their approval was like life, you know, we needed it. And, and I learned that I don't, um, you know, so what we always could wish for a different ending in lives, but you know, I've accepted the way it is and I respect that they live their lives the way they wish. And, and I live my life the way I wish. And that, what more could I ask for at this point? For sure. For sure. Uh, do you feel like that writing the book has, has helped you to, deal like um <clears throat> deal or fully process what happened to you there and how you felt about it like do you feel that writing the book was a positive thing for you absolutely absolutely um and especially reading the book um when it was in its totality it's it's almost like i'm i'm looking at the younger me, you know, and, and I watch myself kind of evolve through time. Um, I learned a lot and, and it's really strange. Like, you know, I, I, everyone who knows me, like I'll, my mouth is like a, like an AK 47 sometimes. Like I like to just pop off, but when you read what you've said and it's turned into words and to paragraphs and chapters and books and parts, you can really, um, I still, reread it often um just to kind of let it soak in this is my life you know and and it's 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 inspired me it's helped me understand myself a lot more it's helped me understand um why and i know it sounds simple but sometimes you just need it like right in your face to see to understand like where i come from so it was kind of like taking an emotional dna test and getting the results back you know, like you're, you know, like learning about like the different parts of me that that um, I can either improve on or the things that I've grown from. So it was a really cool experience, but at times terrifying. Don't think I didn't lay in my bed some nights thinking, oh, my gosh, everyone's going to know, like fill in the blank. They're going to know this. They're, they're going to think I'm a piece of shit. I, I just basically gave them a receipt to tell me like what a loser I am. And they're going to find out all these things that. I've hidden for so long um, and, and nobody knows yet, you know, and that's, <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse. I only have a couple more months till the world finds out um, what I was really going through during times when you may have thought I had it all, um, you know, and uh, not that that makes much of a difference, but for me, knowing that I can now openly, I mean, I'm terrified. Don't like, this has not been like a rah, rah, you know, I'm excited for us and I'm excited that we have a voice and I'm excited that people might understand me more and understand um, and that the people that have treated me poorly throughout the course of my life may hopefully take a step back and realize that I wasn't what they thought, you know, and that they may uh, hopefully just understand me more, which will lend me to being able to feel more accepted and you know i know survivors like me and and i you know and some love me and I, and I love them back all of you you know um and i still in my own way uh just want to be accepted um and and loved by someone for who i am not who they want me to be and this is a great trial in me trying to push past some of my um emotional shyness i guess like i have no problem turning up the heat and just going like you know a full you know 150 miles an hour at whatever i'm about to tackle but emotionally and even in these situations you wouldn't know it but i'm like melting on the inside terrified that someone might see that i'm i'm more vulnerable than i may have let on but that's the truth and if you're gonna 
write a book and if I'm going to start talking, you know, I, I owe the world um, my story. And, and I just hope that my greatest fear of rejection will not come true. You know, I hope for inclusion for all of us. And if someone can learn to understand me through this book, then perhaps they'll understand their daughter more or their husband or their wife more, or their partner more, or their children more, or someone they know more. I hope this opens a dialogue of, of love and acceptance and, and gives uh, survivors kind of a receipt, not only for our pain, but for what our purpose here is now. So. For sure, for sure. Um, are you planning, are you going to be doing, I've had a few people, um, I've seen a few people ask, are you going to do a, a spoken audio book or is an audio book going to be yeah. in the midst of this? Uh-huh. Um, as far as I know at this point, I, I will be the one and I've requested it as well. Um, it ultimately lies with Hachette, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's going to be fine. Um, but yes, I fully plan on recording uh, the audio version of my book. Why anybody would want that? I hate the sound of my own voice. So like, God bless your little heart if you want to listen to mine at night. But um, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't think of anybody else to narrate it but me because it is my my words on paper, you know. So yes, um, and whenever that is going to be released, uh, I probably won't be doing any studio recording until far into the new year. Um, but it, it'll be there, so don't panic. Uh, it'll it'll be on its way. Yeah, I think it. If you're down, I think it would be cool <clears throat> to maybe do a follow up podcast the day that it releases, just to let people know. If are you down to do that? Um, yeah, I, I don't know like what the official schedule will be. I'm, I'm sure the publishing house probably has their agenda as well, but definitely, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm definitely going to be circling back. Um, and especially as it gets closer to the release date and then once it's released, um, I really do hope that I'll be able to have a lot of open dialogue with anyone who's read the book. Um, you know, I don't want to be one of those. I guess now authors that's kind of far and removed and elusive and you know what I mean? Like I'm not inviting you over for a house party, but I definitely want to um, engage with, with people who have read the book and survivors and kind of have intimate discussions about what their experience was writing the book. Um, and then once everything is out, then I could probably answer a lot more questions. Yeah, maybe we could even do a live stream so we could have people like live like commenting, you know, like I read it or it affected me this way or whatnot. We'll figure it out. Yeah, but, um, if it comes out, you know, I'll definitely, there'll be plenty of room for survivors in my life and I'll definitely make the time and space to, to connect. That's what I want. You know, I, I'm probably the loneliest person. I'm not alone, um, but I'm I'm lonely a lot. And, and so this is one of the ways I am, I uh, feel that I've been gifted to try and combat this feeling of just intense loneliness that I experience often. <clears throat> completely understand, completely understand. Okay, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, if you could go back in a time machine and not go through that program or those experiences, would you do it and why? Say the question again, would I go, would I not go? Yeah, so if you could go in a time machine and not go through those experiences in that boarding school, would you do it and why? Absolutely. I never would have chose. I, I don't look back. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those. And again, this is highly contested. Um, and I'm, I totally appreciate if you don't feel this way, but I don't feel that my trauma made me stronger. OK, you know, like I, I no, it destroyed me. Um, I, I don't I didn't take anything positive from that that shithole. Nothing. Um, and and that's my that's my story. You know, other people had other experiences like power to you. OK, but I didn't walk away with any uh, feelings of warmth. And no, I never would have chosen that to be put into my life. Um, it it profoundly changed the trajectory of my life and and impacted me in a way that I had such a delayed onset of learning about who I am well into my 40s now. So um, no, and I wouldn't have chosen that for any of us. Uh, you know, and no, absolutely fucking not would I choose to go back. Um, and but I I guess under the pretense of that none of us, none of my friend, none of us would have been put in that situation, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I would never choose uh, trauma, but, but I was sent there and I did experience tremendous trauma as we all did. 
people may have not, you know, they say, oh, well, it didn't affect me that much or I had a good experience or whatever. Like, okay, that's great. But, but I argue that n no one left unchanged. And, yeah. and that's really how I try and quantify that. We were all changed in some form or another, whether we recognize it um, or not. I, I believe you can't, you know, it's like you can't walk through a river and not get wet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, you just, you know, and then that, that, that was trauma and, and trauma, you know, you can drown in two feet of water or two inches or 20 feet. It doesn't matter. Trauma is trauma is trauma. So no, I wouldn't have sent my younger self back into that situation. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I hope that this book uh, and me trying to speak out as awkward as I am, I just, I hope that this can start a, a revolution really. Um, just, you know, calling all survivors, like let's circle around, you know, and get, get, do, do, I hope this gives us a vehicle to get farther than we've ever gotten on the FOB, you know, um, beyond the wire. So that, that's what I hope. Awesome. Uh, where did you come up with the, with the hashtag I see you survivor? Like what made you choose that? Um, I did. Well, it, it came out of when I made the first video where I was just, uh, trying to, to communicate to the world that I wasn't just this bad bitch that everyone thought I was, that I was really struggling at that time. Um, and in it, I just said, you know, I want you to know that I see you. And, and that's kind of where it came from. And then I don't know when the survivor got tacked onto it. I think it was, I just wanted to make it clear about who I was, the audience that I was trying to reach. And then shortly after that, um, I always had known how many days I had been sent away because I counted. Um, and then the number got attached as well. So that's kind of the evolution um, of that hashtag. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's like the very boring story of how it came about. Okay. And uh, so knowing what you know now, is it your belief that these schools uh, should or even could be regulated at this uh, at this point? Or is it your belief that they all should all just be shut down? Well, all I can really say to that is, is until there's federal regulation, which is like heavily, heavily regulated, you know, there's going to be no change so i can't guarantee anyone's safe passage um and uh and even in that and and more importantly until society changes okay and our attitude changes and our our level of insight and understanding and and um uh, learning that that child abuse and institutional institutionalized child abuse uh, the impact on society is far reaching, uh, generational trauma. It just, it lives in us and, and we are the cycle breakers now. Um, but many of us have suffered. Um, and so with that, uh, I, I don't think any of these formats, I mean, nothing they're doing is therapy. Okay. Like nothing in there. And then the ACEs, like they fail. Okay. They're, they're breeding us to, to have this such self-hatred and and their tactics are savage uh nail salons have more regulation than these <laughs> programs okay so um I, I couldn't even adopt an animal without going through an extensive interview and, pro and reference in this so how are they allowed to just move children around and just here you go and you know and not have full transparency and you know so i think at first First, society needs to change and take a radical stance against child abuse. And once that falls into place and society can get comfortable with what that looks like and, and really kind of get lean into that trauma and understand the damage that the government's paying billions of dollars for kids to be abused, like on domestic soil. I call it domestic terrorism. Um, these programs are no different than internment camps. They're separating uh, young children and adults from their families and 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 coagulating us is labeled as something you know and separating us from society under government control so there is no government control but if you follow the money we all know where that goes mm -hmm. um so you know i think society culture needs to wake the fuck up and once that happens then these changes and regulations w should come heavily into place but until you know there's regulation um an oversight, an accurate oversight, not just like, oh yeah, there's a couple of laws, you can't do this, you can't do that. I mean, I'm talking like heavy handed shit, yeah. you know, like um, I, I just, I won't endorse it. And and even if 
the modalities just don't work. So, you know, like it's just not a, it's not a good system and it's not therapy. Attacking children and, and isolating and humiliating and berating and, and inattentiveness and negligence and all the, the pedophilia and human trafficking, that's not therapy, that's money that's being paid for that child's life to be just completely scrambled and they, you know, and there's no aftercare. There, there's all, I mean, I could go on forever, but you know, I, I think that the troubled teen industry needs to, um, in society, find a way to provide, uh, like, like update your shit, you know, update your life <laughs> computer, you know, like we need a big update, you know, and, and we need to practice more, you know, but educating about harm reduction is really more about education to society than it is teaching them that your kid is bad, they need to go here. Like, since when is sending your kid away the most viable solution you have? Treatment, wherever you can obtain that for your child, I advocate for that, whether it's a rehab, therapy, detox, whatever they need, sequester that for them. But these ideas of, you know, anything that's gonna separate you from communicating with your child or having free access or, you know, like that's just the thing of the past. I, I don't even know why we're still doing it. Um, and yeah, there there definitely are kids that need treatment. I needed treatment. I needed help, but I needed a good therapist. I needed a safe person to talk to. I needed someone to help me label my feelings. I didn't need to get shut up and silenced and shipped off to the farm, literally, and left there. That wasn't helpful. That hurt me. And I was exposed to more trauma and more sexual assault and, and more self-deprivation. So, um, yeah, I just uh, I think we're a long way from regulation, but I think that we're it's more likely that we can turn the tide in society for holding the people accountable for the abuse that they're dispensing um, and cutting off their funding sources and stopping them in their tracks in communities like Agape, like stopping them in their fucking tracks. Like we will cut your resources off. Like we are going to blacklist you and dock the shit out of you. And and look what they did down there in Missouri. You know, like they kicked ass and they're still kicking ass. Um, we need more of that. Instead of focusing on regulation, we need to focus on the children that are in danger right now and and work from there. You know, that that's my humble opinion. I'm, I'm not the expert on that. But, um, you know, I think that that's where the revolution really is going to start about us really paying attention and uh, working to shut down the places that are in place now uh, that are outwardly or overtly, you know, hurting children, period, period, period. <laughs> Period, period, period. <clears throat> um, did you ever struggle with any um, substance abuse after you got out of the program? I'm only asking because I know a lot of great percentage of people did, including me. Yeah, um, at the, not in the sense that you would think. I, I was told repetitively for the time I was there that I was a drug addict and that I was an alcoholic. And I sure did try to become both. Um, but I just wasn't good at it. Uh, I, I'm just not drinking, gave me terrible anxiety. Uh, many of you may not know, I just choose not to drink, um, only because it makes my anxiety worse. Um, and in terms of, of drugs and stuff, young, I dabbled here and there, uh, but it was never anything that was too serious. And I also, I became a mother very young. So I think, um, had I been given more free time, I, you know, I definitely experimented in college and all that shit. Um, but I was just, I was scared of everything. So I think that helped me a lot, but I was definitely addicted to anger uh, and violence for a certain period of time. Um, I still have a streak, but I'm good. Um, you know, I've been known to thug out in uh, my twenties, but um, you know, I was an adrenaline junkie, I'll say. I, I was definitely into high adrenaline, um, you know, uh, you know, working in EMS, you know, going 100 miles an hour, you know, up a highway, lights blazing, sirens going. I mean, there's nothing like it. OK, um, I was addicted to, th to those behaviors, you know. So in terms of substance abuse proper, no, I've, I've never struggled with that addiction. Um, but I do. And I'm not trying to normalize this or anything, but, you know, I smoke cigarettes like I've been trying to quit for my whole life. Like it's just the struggle is real. I get that part of it for sure. Um, but, but no, I, I have not experienced true addiction in that form, but mine did take on other forms, which I think some people can relate to too. I hope I'm not the only one out there that, 
you know, um, and it doesn't make me better than anyone. I, I mean, I, I've treated a lot of people who do have addictions and I do um, understand um, how biologically it works in our brains, but you know, it, it, I don't think it's any different. Uh, society makes it look different, you know, but there's no like, oh, she's an anger addict or, you know, she's, you know, she likes to thug out of, you know, there, there's, they don't yeah. really shame me that way. Um, it's more attached to, you know, drugs, alcohol. So, um, but, you know, I have had my fair share of, of different things that I was totally into that I had no business being at, you know, at that time. All right. Pretty disappoint. You know, I always feel like an asshole being like, no, but, I'm, you know. It's all good. Um, <clears throat> I actually have a 22 months sober off heroin and, and meth. And I, I just smoke weed and I'm on methadone now, but I'm working to get off methadone. But cool. yeah, I just figured I'd ask. Um, and that's pretty much it for questions that I have for you. Uh, so just like closing thoughts, uh, anything that you uh, maybe forgot to say, or maybe something that you would tell a parent that maybe is thinking of sending their kid to a place like this? Um, I guess in, in closing thoughts, um, well, first and foremost, I really appreciate the, the, the safe space to, to kind of come out a little bit and practice my human skills. Um, I'm much used to engaging singular, you know, just me and a computer screen, not me with others, you know, and even the thought sitting here now, I'm just terrified of, of what people are going to think. Um, not that I, it's not like, oh, it matters so much, but I don't want to give anyone the wrong idea or a bad impression. It's my own negative self thinking that consumes me, you know, and that's where a lot of my anxiety comes from. Um, so there's that, but you know, I, I just want every survivor to know that I do see you and, and I do hold space for the the circumstances and the traumas that we've been through. Um, and, you know, there, there's always a better way to do something. And, and, you know, yes, there are definitely kids out there struggling and parents trying to figure out what to do. I can't say what the right or wrong thing is, but I really would encourage parents to not make whatever decision they're going to make while they're in crisis. Um, because those decisions are the ones that the industry is hoping to God that they make is a panic decision um, in a pinch, you know, and, and that's not going to solve anything. Um, and uh, I, I'm just grateful for Survivor Land. I'm, I'm grateful for all the support that I have for the people that have uh, reached out to me um, and just allowing me, if you're watching this, just allowing me into your space, allowing me into your life just for a moment to take the time to maybe get to know each other more, you know, and just to have this kind of uh, experience. I've, I've never written a book before. I've never been so intimately, um, or I'm never, I've never had the opportunity uh, to ever be as I will be as intimately disclosing and upfront and personal as it's going to get. Um, you know, and I just ask for love and acceptance and, um, that's really, uh, th that's as, you know, I'm as overwhelmed and shocked as everybody else, um, that this even happened to me never in my life. If you had told me 27 years ago when I was laying in the blanket face down, wishing I was about to die, uh, that someday this pain would be useful and that someday I would live long enough to write a book and and vocalize our needs and try and start a riot um i would have lost the million dollar bet so uh, i'm just really happy that i am here and that um that i get this opportunity to not only share with survivor land but give us the opportunity to share this as far as as we can to try and really change the world for sure for sure <clears throat> Well, before we close, if you've watched this part in the video and you haven't liked, please like, please share the video, please leave a comment um, just to say hi or where you went or whatnot. Um, and also, I wanted to let you guys, <clears throat> if you haven't seen the video I just released on Tales of Addiction and Recovery, it would mean a lot to uh, for you to go watch it. I put my heart and soul into that video. Uh, it essentially addresses everything essentially that happened that I well, not everything, but essentially the the biggest things that happened to me when I was using drugs and in that scene that uh, changed my outlook on life and that scarred me. So I I talked about a whole lot of things in there that I've never really talked to that many people at all about. So it did mean a lot to me for you guys to watch it and 
maybe you know uh, leave a comment and let me know what you thought um, if it helped you or whatnot. Uh, that's why I do this is to help people and the comments that I see from people that it, it's helped it really touches my heart and so I just want to thank you guys for being here and thanks again Liz for coming on and doing the interview and uh, let's coordinate uh, closer to when you drop the uh, book and we'll figure out a time to do do a live stream or something awesome, for the drop. awesome. all right cool you have a wonderful night you thank, you. thank you again Bye. Bye.